Hello, everyone, on this beautiful September day. I'm Allison Tolman, JASA board member and program committee member serving alongside Amy Poster and Victoria Melendez. For those of you who don't know anything about JASA, we were founded in 1973 as the Ukiyo-e Society of America. And through the decades, our mission has greatly expanded to include studying all types of Japanese art of which, of course, photography is one of the topics that we cover very rarely. And we're excited to have Maggie Mustard today, who has actually presented to JASA before. We went to the Museum of Sex with her to learn about Nobuyoshi Araki several years ago. But Maggie, who is now Dr. Maggie Mustard, visiting assistant professor of art, at Wesleyan University's Department of Art and Art History, will be talking to us today about post-war Japanese photography from 1945 to 1980, focusing on the major themes and practitioners at the heart of the media's development following the end of the Second World War. We would also like to note, and we will be sharing a link to this after this webinar, that Dr. Mustard is a contributing lecturer, content strategist, and senior researcher for the project entitled Behind the Camera, Gender, Power, and Politics in the History of Japanese Photography. As I said, we'll be sharing a link to that project after this webinar. But in the meantime, over to you, Maggie, and thank you. Thank you, Allison. Um, thank you all, and um, welcome. And I'm delighted to be here this evening. Um, thank you to JASA for the invitation to speak today, and a thank you especially to Amy, Victoria, Allison, and Helen um, for all of your help and support. Um, today's talk will largely be an overview of a very rich and complex period in the history of Japanese photography, and so I'll necessarily have to gloss over many details, many specific works, many specific photographers, but I hope that the story that I offer today will give you a sense um, of some of the bigger questions, techniques, and themes that were guiding photographers in Japan in the post-war period. And as a structure for today's talk, I've suggested that we look at three photographers in particular in chronological order, Domon Ken, Kawada Kikuji, and Nakahira Takuma. Um, and I suggested that we look at them together through the lens of the overarching theme of photographic legibility. And by legibility, I want to consider, I want us to consider ideas about how difficult or easy is it to read a photographic image in question? Is it intended to be didactic or suggestive? Um, and are there multiple possible readings at play? And hopefully, through these questions about legibility and photographic language, we can understand a little bit more about some of the developments and changes in the medium of photography in the first three to four decades of the post-war era in Japan. So for part one of our talk tonight, um, we'll, as I mentioned, we'll focus on the photographer Domon Ken, who was born in 1909 and whose career, very importantly, spans the pre-war, wartime, and immediate post-war years. Domon was, sorry, this is taking a second to load. There we go. Domon um, was the fiercest proponent of a photographic style and sometimes ideological approach known as realism. And he solidified his role as one of the most important artistic voices of the first decade of post-war Japan, through his very prolific photography publications, exhibitions, and maybe most importantly, monthly judging and monthly columns in magazines, photography magazines, such as camera and photo art. During World War II, Domon, um, along with many of his fo fellow photographers of the period, like Kimura Ihe and Watanabe Yoshio, worked as a photojournalist for various government projects or propaganda outlets, um, especially like the magazine Nippon, which pushed idealized imagery of Japan as a prosperous and richly cultured nation for mostly international audiences. He also documented, as you can see here, 
Japan's various wartime efforts on the home front. And these photographs um, documenting young female nurses in training, I think subtly marry support for the war with ideals about femininity, humanitarianism, and shared unwavering collective labor. After the war um, and after being fired from his government work uh, due to his anti-war stance, Domon undertook regular trips to Nara Prefecture to document an eighth century Buddhist temple known as Muroji. Um, this practice is known as Koji Junrei or Old Temple Pilgrimage. And the photographs taken on these trips would be published in a photo book in 1954, just titled Muroji. And they document, as you can see in very delicate and painstaking detail, the statues, architecture and surrounding landscape of the temple and its nearby village. But I wanted to point also to the foreword of the photo book, Muroji, as it reveals even more about Domon's approach to photography and how it had changed in the immediate post-war years. In this text, Domon speaks not only about the temple and its contents, but most importantly about the villagers and their lives, saying that he visited Muro Muroji during, quote, the worst days of and after the war. To the casual visitor, this is the quote continued, it would seem as if the daily peaceful routine of its handful of inhabitants go their even way from day to day without visible change or variation. I have visited with them several times a year over a long period of time now and know that under this placid surface there is change, sorrow, joy, disaster, and good fortune." End quote. So, Perhaps in an effort to redeem photojournalism or reportage or documentary photography in the years following its mobilization as government propaganda, Domon began to turn his camera to corners of society where reality of life, which included hardship, could be more easily seen so long as it was framed correctly. Increasingly, his uh, post-war photography focuses on subjects like poverty, on returning wartime veterans, and primarily on children living in the cities and towns of Japan, turning his camera into a tool for socially conscious image making, all buttressed by the idea of realism, and most importantly, this idea of the absolutely unstaged snapshot. This term was coined in a 1953 essay he wrote um, called Photographic Realism and the Salon Picture. And in this essay, Domon defined the importance of the absolutely unstaged snapshot as such. Quote, if there is the, even the slightest hint of a pose, artificiality, or performance in the photograph, no matter how well it is composed or how demonstrative it may be, with time and with repeated viewing, it will not hold up. The very foundation of such a photograph is weak. It will fail to maintain interest. It is only when there is not even the vaguest taint of falseness in the photograph that it may be rightly termed absolutely unstaged. Even a photograph that is at first captivating and seems a wonderful masterpiece will, if it has any element of artificiality, eventually lose its impact as one continues to look at it because there is a defilement that worked its way into the image at the very moment the shutter was released." End quote. Doan actually diagrammed the way in which a particular subject could be photographed according to different compositional arrangements, leading to a more or less effective emotional and therefore socially conscious result. In these schematics, which you see here, a chair is shown in three varying compositional arrangements ranging from neutral at the top to most emotionally potent at the bottom. In the first, which is neutral, the chair is shown in the center of the image, equally balanced on all sides. Domon says, it fills the space the necessary amount to be furniture, end quote. So it's best suited for a photograph of either a newly designed chair or a chair of some historical value. In the second and third schematic drawings, Domon demonstrates how shifting the distance and relative height of the horizon line can introduce an inherent emotional component to the photograph. So in the middle, in the middle drawing, he argues that in photographing it from above and creating a sort of unbalanced negative space above the chair, there is now the sense, quote, that the chair is in an empty room, that this is a chair in which no one is sitting. And this, he says, invites feelings 
about the chair. Finally, in diagram C at the bottom, by distancing oneself even further from the chair as a photographer and by raising the horizon line, the photographer can, according to Domon, intensify those feelings, just as it intensifies the significance of the empty room and the empty chair. Domon argues that there is the sense in this last example that someone has just vacated the chair and the feeling is such that, quote, their footsteps still echo. So for the rest of this part of the talk, I thought I would look briefly at more closely, uh, sorry, briefly and more closely um, at this work by Domon, which is a two volume set. Um, one is called The Children of Chikuho and the other is called Rumie's Father is Dead. This is a two volume publication that was released in 1960. And for this series, Domon traveled to the village of Chikuho, which is in Northern Kyushu in the Southern Islands of Japan. And um, the village was in a predominantly uh, coal mining area and the villagers were very impoverished and um, as well as um, often plagued with a variety of health problems um, resulting from the mining, um, including especially bronchial infections from a slag heap and from leaking sulfur gas. So, these books were published on extremely cheap paper, um, almost newspaper paper, and were sold for only 100 yen at the time, um, which was an integral part for Domon of the socially conscious strategy underpinning the project. So Domon didn't want these images to be rarefied and confined to gallery walls. He wanted them to be widely accessible and intimate in your experience with them. So a brief look through a selection of these photographs shows Domon employing realist photography and the absolutely unstaged snapshot to elicit strong emotional or affective reactions in the viewer or reader. These images of children, families, and workers are captured without seeming artifice or staging in the daily actions of their lives. And Domon argued that this, quote, had the potential to connect directly with societal reality. In photography, there can be nothing more impure or self-destructive than to imitate a painting or to have a model pose. To depict a societal reality, he continues, the photographer himself is already equipped in his very person with the absolutely unstaged snapshot for which the camera mechanism provides the ideal vehicle. In other words, photographic realism looks directly at reality and points reality in a better direction. It is a resistant mode of which photography is the perfect manifestation. So this same ethos um, underpinned, so I'm just gonna get this to load, there we go. This same ethos um, underpinned um, Domon's 1958, so slightly earlier publication called Hiroshima, um, in which he paired photographs of atomic bomb survivors known as Hibakusha, who were struggling at the time with surgeries, hospital stays, disability, poverty. Um, he pairs these moments of hardship with moments of very pure, simple human joy, like this family portrait of the Otani family um, from the 1958 publication. And I bring Hiroshima up now as a way to link part one and part two of our talk tonight. The second photographer, um, that we'll be discussing today, Kawada Kikuji, actually traveled first to Hiroshima himself with Domun Ken as his assistant during the late 1950s. Now, Kawada was born in 1933 and grew up during the war, um, but was too young to actively fight in it, which is one of the key ways in which this generation of artists and thinkers has often defined itself um, in the post-war period. It's a particular generational relationship to the war um, that has a very different relationship with things like memory, trauma, propaganda, and power um, than those artists from Domon's generation had. Um, so here I'm showing images from a series that Kawada Kikuji published in the 1953 October issue of Camera Magazine where the photographs that Kawada submitted, um, out of the photographs that Kawada submitted to this magazine, the ones that were selected for publication were selected by Domon Ken. So he was the monthly judge 
um, for this issue, and he selected these photographs. And I can think you can see here the degree to which Domon's realism in both the technique and the socially conscious subject matter were so influential to the younger generation of photographers during this time. Um, these are photographs that Kawada took of Tachikawa Base, um, which is a US, was a US military installation in Japan during the post-war period. These are sites of cross-cultural um, connection and friction. And in particular, Domon um, selected Kawada's photographs here to mostly feature images of children. So he further edited and sort of massaged Kawada's um, series to make it more cohesive and emotionally effective. As a little background, Kawada attended university in Tokyo. Um, he graduated with an economics degree. He did participate, so he's sort of an autodidact in terms of photography. Um, he participated in the university's um, photography club. But after he graduates, um, he is hired as a staff photographer, so a photojournalist for a publishing company, uh, Shinchosha. And he works there until 1959, after which he goes freelance. And this is an important period for Donon. 1959 also marks the year in which he joins forces with Tomatsu Shome, Hosoe Eko, Narahara Iko, and others to form the photo agency that's known as Vivo, V-I-V-O. And Vivo was relatively short-lived as a group. It only exists from 1959 to 1961. And it's also not quite an art movement in the way that we think of them now. It's much more similar to an agency, a photo agency like Magnum, where the member photographers were interested in having a shared collaborative space and tools um, for their practice. Not necessarily that they shared um, cohesive aesthetic, theoretical or political goals, and certainly not that they published a shared manifesto. So one thing though that I think they do have in common is they all grew up as photographers and artists under Domon Ken and under the influence of um, his absolutely unstaged snapshot. And while Kawada himself um, has acknowledged an enormous debt to Domon and the photographic theory and doctrine, He's also remarked that by this period, by the late 1950s, he began, Kawada began to see that kind of approach as very limiting and that his own images began to take on a different quality, something more image-y, iconic. He uses the word ezo in Japanese um, rather than realistic. So it's during these shared trips that Kawada and Domon take together to Hiroshima that where Kawada really starts to branch out and find his own photographic voice, which is distinct from the dominance of the absolutely unstaged snapshot. And I'm including this relatively long quote here um, from a 2005 essay that Kawada wrote about this experience called The Illusion of the Stain, because I think it illustrates what a profound and unsettling experience it was for him to visit post-war Hiroshima as a photographer. So I'll just read it very quickly together. A veil of morning mist left me unable to see anything in the city for a wide expanse. Among the people that appeared from the gray streets, and this is him talking about arriving in Hiroshima, among the people that appeared from the gray streets of the city were many with poor eyesight. Suddenly, someone from behind me, perhaps an American, asked me the way to a hotel. But when I looked closely, I immediately realized that both of his eyes were slightly opaque and that he was visually impaired. When we got in a taxi together, but he didn't speak and neither did I. When the driver turned his head for the pay payment, I saw that his eyes were also abnormal. In my hotel room, when I faced the mirror to look at my own eyes, the pupils were dilated. The first time I encountered the fear of losing my sight was in the intense sunlight of Hiroshima. And this is important to highlight because I think he's linking here this relationship to the medical reality of Hiroshima, which is that many atomic bomb survivors had cataracts um, and visual impairment as the result of their exposure to atomic radiation, um, but also connecting it with this fear as a young photographer that visually, like the medium and the technique of photography wouldn't be able to be enough in Hiroshima. He was losing his eyesight um, and that he would have to do something else in order to capture 
or document what was happening in this city. So the first photographs that Kawada takes in Hiroshima during those trips with Donon Ken are taken after sneaking into the Hiroshima Prefectural Industrial Promotion Hall. Here, you seen here, both uh, before the war and after the war. It's colloquially known as the A-bomb dome because it was right under this, the sort of impact of the atomic bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima in 1945. It's also known as the Genbaku Dome. The images that Kawada takes inside this building, this ruin, are close cropped photographs of the interior walls and ceilings of the building. They're divorced from their architectural context and they're presented with this obsessional um, interest in texture. They depict the flaking and smeary skin of the surfaces of the walls and the ceilings as this sort of really eerie and unearthly topography. And Kawada called these images stains. He writes, quote, in a brief moment, dozens of people disappeared within a flash of burning rays measuring over 4,000 degrees at the surface, followed by the pouring black rain, which over time resulted in the sudden in appearance of the stain. So what Kawada is doing here is equating these atomic shadows, which are a documented phenomenon um, in the city of Hiroshima following the blast of the atomic bomb, with what he's seeing on the interior of this building, of this ruin, with the act of photography, because the photo photograph is also a flash that captures an image or leaves an indexical trace, just like the atomic shadows that you see here. So the stains, there we go, the stains are the photographs that make up this sort of center or the nucleus of what eventually would be this 1965 publication known as Chizu or the map. Um, it was published in 65 and it was designed by Sugiyura Kohei. It's 190 pages of photographs, all full bleed, no text. And they're all kind of packaged and nestled into one another via this double gatefold design known as Kanon Buraki. So every photograph can be unfolded and unfolded the other way um, and unfolded, folded back. Um, and so at its core, this photograph, is, this photo book is a kind of palimpsest of Japan's present, past um, and possible future where a lot of the subjects and themes are exploring ideas about memories of the war and signs of sort of national identity. This is just showing you the various kind of ways in which you have to enter the photo book. So it has a slip cover, an interior slip cover, and then here's the actual photo book on the right. Um, and so to get into it, you have to unfold it like this. Um, you have to sort of physically unpackage it. Go. So in the final photo book publication, these stains that I mentioned earlier are accompanied by images of wartime relics and contemporary trash or detritus. So we have heat damaged sake bottles, keloid scars from atomic bomb survivors. Um, we have memorial photographs from um, suicide pilots or special attack force pilots. We have stacked television screens. Um, discarded packs of Lucky Strike cigarettes, Coca-Cola bottles. There's the chrysanthemum crest of the Imperial House that's sort of grimy with shadows. You have iron scraps, police investigations, mug shots. There are all of these different images colliding together. Um, architecture, detritus, and stains. And this sort of sudden encounters and coincidences between images. And this makes up the real core of the map. So for our theme um, of sort of legibility and language today, I'd like to focus on sort of two image exchanges that happen in this photo book. Um, they both happen about halfway through. And if you open, um, we just start here. There we go. So once you open one of these double gatefold designs, um, this is the image that you see here in front of you that's uh, revealed. So this is a four page spread. It's actually two separate photographs 
two page photographs that are put together. But at first glance, they're so seemingly similar at the middle scene that they appear to be one image, but they're actually two. So the image on the left of the scene that you see here is a photograph of crumpled fraying fabric overlapped at the bottom edge of the photograph here with a page of equally wrinkled printed text. And the smudging of the light sort of obscures portions of the photograph's content. But from um, the reflection, it also is obscured by the reflection of glass and other windows and that sort of thing. So it obscures the whole image. Um, this image is of a display case at the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, inside which this piece of fabric and paper rest. And the text at the paper of the bottom edge of the photograph is very heavily obscured, but you can make out sort of scattered phrases. So um, you can make out phrases like imperial ancestors, country, benevolence, and then other phrases like yokuchu yokuko, which is proper fidelity and filial piety. Um, and then most significantly, a glimpse of the word chokuko, which is imperial rescript. So based on the context that this is in the Hiroshima Peace Memorial uh, Museum and the snatches of these phrases, it's clear that this is a copy of the imperial rescript on education, which was issued by the Meiji Emperor um, in 1890, but was used continually throughout the Second World War as a document with a kind of sacred aura, um, which defined the moral contact of citizens um, and children through education. And so based on this context, we can assume that the fabric that you see behind it is the school uniform of a young child in Hiroshima and the damage to it was damaged incurred during the atomic explosion. So on the right side of the seam, the middle seam here, we see another photograph where this sort of gray fabric is seemingly continued or at least echoed here. And on this surface, you also see that the text that you can see has been sort of half obscured by light and shadow and then by rotating the image on the side also. But if you look at it a little bit more closely, you can start to see that the brushwork um, is one of these last will and testaments um, used or put forward by members of the Tokotai, which is the special attack force. Most people know them as kamikaze pilots. Um, text or sort of captions from this photograph recognize that it was taken at the Edejima Memorial Museum. So this is a, a sort of naval history museum in Japan. So there's a visual equivalency between these two photographs. And I think that's important, not just of texture and technique, but more importantly in the way that meaning here is only made clear to the reader through these sort of obfuscated and truncated phrases and inscriptions. So language here is rendered half comprehensible and the content of the photographs only starts to sort of resolve through the work of extremely close and sustained looking. You can't just get a sense of what's happening in this photograph glancing at it, right? So it's also important to note though that these photographs were initially taken in the environment of a museum one memorial and one of military history. And these are sites, museums, that are sites of supposed clarity. Um, clarity of text, clarity of historical narrative, of overarching message, and a mission of sort of edifying or educating the public. And Kawada's very intentional, I think, confusion and obfuscation of language here, um, and his deliberate refusal to let these images be clear about what they are or what they're saying um, points to two significant interpretations of this photo book. One, that any attempts to render the past easily legible should be very suspicious. And two, that one reading this or viewing this should attempt to view competing or even antithetical narratives of the past as a network instead of overlapping ideas. So it's not one or the other, but instead how do these two ideas or multiple ideas work together? Again, very briefly, I'm gonna try and move as quickly as I can. About halfway through this photo book, another really revealing kind of collision of images occurs. 
This is one half of a four page spread and in the interior. So on the outside of this, there's a memorial, a photograph of a memorial statue of what is known as the three human bullets, which you can see at Yasukuni Shrine in Tokyo. And then it peels open at the center to reveal a four page expanse of what looks very like abstract ripples or smoke, but is actually keloid scars of a hibaksha of an atomic bomb survivor. So the, both these two images, the subjects of these two images, the three human bullet statue and its placement at Yasukuni Shrine, which represents a narrative of wartime military heroism, um, is the kind that would have been, this is the kind of narrative that would have been outright censored during the allied occupation of Japan. And then at least deeply discouraged in the following post-occupation years. And then similarly, the bodies of atomic bomb survivors and their very visible keloid scars were likewise very complicated sites of memory and national identity um, in the post-war years. Most survivors themselves felt a lot of shame um, and confusion about their own illnesses or disabilities and their status. Um, while nationally, the idea of this pain and trauma was kind of antithetical in some ways to the image that Japan wanted to project to the world and to America as a now thriving and prosperous ally. So as metonyms for these different narratives of World War II, the subjects of these two photographs become really symbolic nodes in Kawada's network of past and present and future. They stand in for grief, for survivorhood, for stifled national mourning or heroism or repentance. Um, but it's not just the subjects that do this, it's the way in which Kawada photographs them. He manipulates them and organizes these image in the photo book in such a way that the lack of visual clarity is the most important thing that's happening. So whether it's the text that you can't read or the sort of slippage of abstract and human form, um, none of these photographs communicate their content directly to the viewer. It's meant to be fundamentally sort of unstable and half legible at every turn. So for the final part of this talk tonight, I'd like to focus on the subsequent generation of photographers who belong to a group of artists and critics known as Provoke. And within that group, I would especially like to focus on the work of Nakahira Takuma and two projects of his. For a Language to Come, um, which is a photo book um, that was published, and then a um, more expansive and um, participatory or performatory, per, per, sort of performative installation um, that he put together in 1971 in Paris. So Provoke was a magazine, for, a photography and photographic theory magazine um, founded in 1968 by uh, several photographers and uh, critics. Um, Moriyama Daido, Nakahira Takuma, Okada Takahiko, Takanashi Yutaka, and Taki Koji. Um, there were others involved too, but those are sort of the main members. It actually only ever ran for three issues, but it had a profound effect on the field of photography and the theory of photography due to its extremely radical and experimental nature. Um, the photographers associated with Provoke used overall an aesthetic approach that came to be known as are bure bokeh, which means um, rough, blurry, and out of focus, or grainy, blurry, and out of focus. Often, their subjects were the busy and chaotic urban landscapes of Tokyo and other major metropolitan centers, or their sort of immediate environs. They would also approach these subjects by shooting photographs out of their car windows, by running down the street, by sprinting up stairs, or by deliberately not using the viewfinder, so no finder shots essentially. And then they would also combine these techniques of shooting with um, other sort of post-production or development techniques of exposing the skeleton of photography itself. So by that I mean showing the medium 
um, including, as you see here above, showing the film sprockets or other kind of destabilizing and kind of self-referential techniques of photography. So these strategies, and um, I'm going to click through here um, as I talk uh, Nakahira's For a Language to Come, um, which is the 1970 publication. Um, these photographs simultaneously disrupted any remaining claims to realism or a kind of objective erratic truth in photography. Um, through the insistence on, photog on the photograph as material and as infinitely reproducible, it fully undermined this project that the Provoke photographers took on, the insistence on the photograph's objective reality through this sort of are bude bokeh strategy of literally blurring the barriers between photograph and the photographer's experience or existence. So Nakahira himself wrote a photography that, quote, it is not just yourself seeing, but the premonition that you yourself might be seen. At that moment, various gazes move around you and come in and are tangled and you systematize the whole aggregation of those relations of seeing and being seen that envelop you. And what one could call the one who systemizes these gazes becomes that which would replace the photographer. So to conclude the talk or start to conclude the talk for this evening, I'd like to end with Nakahira's 1971 installation for the seventh Paris Biennial for Emerging Artists. This was a festival that brought um, artists from all around the world um, uh, together for a week in Paris in 1971. Nakahira was invited to be part of the festival or the biennial that had the theme intervention. And instead of bringing um, a previously um, completed project, Nakahira decided to instead create a project on site and as part of the biennial itself. So this would um, come to be known as circulation, time, date, place, events. Um, this project is a constantly or was a constantly evolving and almost participatory or performative project where for the duration of the week of the biennial, Nakahira challenged himself to photograph pretty much indiscriminately everything around him and then include those photographs that he took in the installation on the same day in which they were taken. So what that meant was that the installation quickly, very quickly, grew and grew and grew as these photographs amassed. At certain points, Nakahira was taking 100 to 200 pho new photographs every day and then developing them and hanging them often while they were still wet as part of the installation. And so he ran out of room on the kind of display board of the installation and then instead kind of let them spill over into other spaces of this site. So he put them on a kind of makeshift desk or he kind of threw them on the wall behind or as you see here, he let them start to sort of spread out on the floor in front of the official display where they sort of started to collect dirt or were kicked up by passers-by. Um, the ultimate goal that, and you can see here the way that they sort of started to curl up or get kicked around. Um, and Naka Kira's goal here was to ideally record images that were initially prescribed by a certain date and place and time, and then immediately recirculate them back into the reality from which they came. So he's trying to further erase or collapse the boundaries between the photographic image and the world that both produced and will consume them. And the transformation here is one from Domon Ken's assertion of the photograph as this objective record of didactic emotional truth or realism to this sort of fluid and deliberately kind of half legible gray area of Kawada's photographs that really deal with how do you read memory into a photograph and how do you read the present into a photograph based on those memories. 
to then, I'm arguing, these provoke era photographers um, insisting not only on this radical ousting of the control of the subjective photographer for this sort of instantaneous moment of relational experience, but also that the photograph has or may have the ability to capture in this sort of performative act of photographing what escapes kind of legible or visual consciousness. And I believe that is all I have for today. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you found it interesting. I believe now we'll open it up to um, Q&A. So I'll hand it over to whoever is, is it Allison? Yes, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Maggie. Um, it's so interesting how you, and we want to thank you for analyzing these historic photographs and putting them into context so that we can understand their meaning. Um, to me, I mean, seeing these very almost brutal images of post-war Japan is really interesting because often when, when people look at Japanese art, it's always beautiful Japan. And these three photographers were really, it, it was reportage. You know, I, I think that's really interesting. Um, we do have a few questions that were emailed in previously, um, one of which is very basic, and it's, um, did the people, did, did these people print their own photos? Yes, um, almost 100% um, of the time. Um, for Domon Ken especially, um, even though by the end of, you know, by the post-war era, when he was very, um, successful and very influential and had assistance and that sort of thing. The act of developing the photograph, you know, being in the dark room, that portion of the photographic process is key, right, to him. And I think this idea of maybe somewhat ironically creating the realism that he wants people to see in a photograph. Um, and certainly in the selection of images that are included in a series or a magazine or in a photo book, that's also really key. So he would have been very involved in that. For Domon, or sorry, for Kawada Kikuji and the Vivo group, um, the Vivo agency or the Vivo group in and of itself was a place where all of these um, photographers could come together and pool their resources, including darkroom and development resources. So yes, they were all printing their own photographs at this time period. Um, and then for the Provoke group, the sort of experimental nature of their work um, absolutely dictated in some ways that they be responsible for the sort of experiment or chance of the photograph from start to end, right? Um, so yes, the short version, the short answer is, is yes, but sort of for different reasons. And um, another, another person um, writes in to ask, can you talk a little bit about domestic and international exhibitions? You mentioned the biennial, but were these artists participating in other exhibitions? And also, it's kind of a follow-up question from somebody else. How much contact did they have with foreign photographers? Um, the answer to both is um, both questions is definitely by the 1970s, quite a lot. So mm -hmm. in in the early 1950s or so, there is some um, sort of cross-cultural um, exchange starting to happen, um, especially with, um, I would say, Western photographers, their work starting to come in to Japan after the war. Um, so in particular, the Americans I know is extremely popular in Japan. Um, other major photo books and photo series, right? They're getting circulated and talked about in the photo magazines that I mentioned in particular, right? There isn't a ton of Japanese photography in international exhibitions until the early 1970s, really. There's a couple here and there. The biggest one is MoMA, and Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, does a sort of new Japanese photography exhibition in the early 1970s. And it's very, very influential and important um, for the exposure and the, the kind of um, exchange of ideas for both these Japanese artists and I think then young um, um, American artists, uh, photographers at the time too. Um, 
it's also that exhibition is also really important in terms of like establishing for an American audience, like what the narrative of Japanese photography is up until that point, right? Um, so by the 1970s, yes, you do really start to see much more fluid international exchange um, between say Japan and America, Japan and Europe. Um, the wartime years really shut down that, that exchange, right? It had been going very strong through the 1920s and 1930s. You have Japanese photographers working at the Bauhaus, working in America and vice versa. Right. Um, but then obviously the Second World War really shuts that down and it does take a little while for it to get going again. Yeah. And what about uh, photography schools in Japan? Is this a, a part of art departments or where would people learn photography? I know that you mentioned, um, I think that one of the photographers is definitely self-taught. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Yes. So it varies. Um, Domon Ken, for example, uh, really got his training by training or learning from um, a slightly older photographer, um, Natori Onosuke, who was sort of at, before Domon's time was sort of the um, major kind of new photography figure in Japan. Natori also did uh, quite a bit of propaganda work. Mm -hmm. um, during the war. And so um, as a young sort of photographer, Domon really learned from him in terms of how you photograph, right, technically, and then what are some of the ideological things that are happening underneath photography too. Um, so Domon, for example, learns kind of as an apprentice. Um, Kawada, for example, he doesn't go to school for photography, but kind of gets involved. He actually, Kawada talked about how he actually picked up photography as a hobby in high school because he thought it would make him like really cool and that like girls would want to date him <laughs> if he had a camera um so it you know for him he didn't get formal training but then he really got um more exposure again by sort of working with with Domon and um, and then working as a freelance sort of photojournalist so it's a lot of sort of on the job training right I don't really think you get, it doesn't really get codified as sort of an art school option. Um, I would say until the sort of 70s and 80s. Again, there is an option to study photography at some art schools, um, but it's not as ubiquitous or widespread, I would say, as it is now. So most of these photographers in this sort of first couple of decades of the post-war period are not getting formal art school training necessarily. We, we often hear in contemporary ceramics or even in printmaking that there are, you know, there are, there are families that techniques or that lore is passed down through generations. Did that, did that happen in photography? Yes, I think, you know, there, I think in photography though, you do tend to see instead of a lineage, a continuous lineage of sort of sharing and carrying on ideas. I think what you see, and maybe the talk today talked or touched on this a little bit more or gestured to it, a much quicker turnover of, well, that's what my father's quote unquote generation did, or that's what the other generation did. So I'm going to flip it on its head. Um, I think that there are shared techniques and things that are learned. And there is, you know, I think you can see it even with like the generation of Vivo photographers and the way that they talk about, say, Domun Ken's generation of photographers, there's gratitude there and a real appreciation for what they did. But at the same time, there is a sense of, well, we're not going to do it that way because we think photography can do something else mm -hmm. um, or it can do something more or something different. And so there's this a sense of, I think, pushing back more and more. Um, to the point that like when you get to the provoke era, there's this almost this kind of wholesale like throw everything out, burn all the negatives almost. And in fact, Nakahira does uh, burn almost his entire, like actually burns his entire um, extant trove of negatives in I think it's 75 or so as a way to kind of burn the past to the ground and say, no more, I'm going to start new. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember that when we um, went with you to the 
Iraqi show, there were lots of um, art books and art journals. But you mentioned you really focused on Provoke in this talk. I mean, were were these were were there other journals? I and mean, I know that you you mentioned that things were printed on really cheap paper because people didn't have a lot of funds. Um, so those that kind of ephemera doesn't tend to stick around a lot, right? Were there other journals? Yes. So this is actually, in some ways, especially the, especially I would say like 1950s, 1960s, there are photography exhibitions in Japan, but actually one of the main modes of circulation and dissemination of work is through photography journals and magazines, and then also through photo books. So the main photography magazines are camera, photo art, um, camera Mainichi, there's about a half dozen of them or so that um, are really crucial, not for, not just for getting new or young photographers access to a publication, like, so you submit a work and maybe it gets selected and then, you know, all of these members that are subscribing to this journal get to see your photograph, not just that, but also access to conversations that are happening about photography. So you would get everything from exhibition reviews to roundtable discussions on like, what are we doing about US-based photography? Like what's happening there? Or like, what is realism in photography? Or what is subjectivity, right? Or even just like smaller discussions about like tech technology involved in the photographic process itself, right? So these journals and magazines and kind of um, periodicals were hugely important part of the community and part of the kind of artistic discourse. Photo books are kind of a different story because they there's a lot of them in the post-war period. In some ways you could think of it as like the seminal or most important um, mode of photography in Japan in the post-war period. It's not the exhibition, it's not the group show, it's the photo book. Um, and they would range, I think even just seeing like Chikuho no Kutomotachi, the children of Chikuho versus something like um, the map. Vast differences in terms of production design, of um, price, of number of photographs inside, of relationship between text and image. So they really would run the gamut, but those were the primarily mode of an artist or a photographer getting their own message out there in a kind of complete package. Um, so they could be very expensive and very hard to produce and have design be really, really simple. Our final question is um, about the what's happening in contemporary Japanese photography today. Mm -hmm. And specifically, are photographers, are, have people gone more towards using digital rather than film? Or what, how, how do you see that? Ken? Yeah, it's, I mean, in some ways, it's kind of similar to how photograph young contemporary photographers are working all over the world. I think there are some artists who um, really like digital work and like what it can do and really um, rely on it for various reasons and do amazing work with it. And then there's other artists that, photographers that um, have kind of in some ways returned to the analog and even gone so far back as to use, I know one, um, a uh, woman photographer who she won the she won the Kimura Ihe award a couple years ago. She does fantastic work. She actually remade an old panorama camera, like a physical that you have to like turn like a huge panorama camera. Like she remade this kind of historical object in order to take these really ghostly kind of beautiful panoramic um, photographs of Hawaii and Japan and kind of over like, so there's, there's artists that are kind of doing everything. There's some going all the way back to like the camera obscura and, and others that are really kind of digital heavy. Um, I think part of what's nice about the contemporary moment in Japan, in photography at least, is that um, it doesn't feel constrained. And I would say this applies sort of globally, but like it doesn't feel constrained anymore by either kind of ideology or aesthetics that whatever you want to do as a photograph, a photographer or an artist, like that's available to you in terms of technique or medium. Um, and so that's why you see, I think, so many young photographers really having the freedom to explore and experiment with lots of different ways of photographing. And actually I said that there was um, one final question, but actually there's one more final question. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> um, 
we didn't touch at all on women photographers. And maybe you could just talk very quickly. Is, is their work different from that of their male counterparts? No, but what is different is the um, access that they had to the spaces of um, exhibition, circulation, and um, conversation. So um, a really important one, I think, in some of the audience may have already heard of her is Ishiuchi Miyako. She sort of straddles um, between the eras of like Vivo and Provoke, although I think she's maybe more often associated with Provoke um, because her photography often has the quality of kind of Ade Bude Boke. She knew all of them, all of Vivo uh, gentlemen too. And, you know, she has, there have been thankfully many now exhibitions and scholarly articles and books and things about her work um, and about the how hard she worked within the context of post-war Japanese photography, which was a very closed society um, in a lot of ways um, to women. Um, so it's not that their work was different. Um, it's that their access was different. Um, and so that's why it's been so difficult, I think, in some ways to like tell these sort of overarching narratives um, sort of with women because the narrative for so long has been, it was basically men that were making this. And I did it tonight too, right? Um, so I would also take this opportunity to, to plug the Behind the Camera project, and, which has been spearheaded by two colleagues of mine, Kelly McCormick and Carrie Cushman. Um, they've done an incredible job of sort of starting this um, project together to really start to retell the narrative of post-war photography um, by centering the production of women in the field. Um, and it's a great way to see just how many women were doing this work. Um, and it's also a little depressing to think about how like even though there were so many women doing this work, how hard it's been to somehow find a space for them in these stories. Well, thank you, Maggie. And as I mentioned, we will be sharing a link to that project. You'll send Great. it to me and I'll send it to everybody who attended tonight. JASA members, you may know the name Ishiu Chimiako because she um, was a cover of Impressions a few, a, few, a few issues ago. So Maggie, again, thank you so much for tonight. Thank and, you. Um, I really hope that the rest of you will tune in again on November 8th when Allison Miller will be talking to us about industry and institutions, woodblock prints in the Meiji cultural imagination. Thank you, everyone, and good evening.